Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. As always, I'd like to start by thanking and acknowledging the generous listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors patron family. Visit patreon.com slash talking Tutors for more information. Join the Talking Tutors patron family to instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to enter patron only monthly giveaways. August's prize is a gift pack from the recent exhibition, The Tudors, Art and Majesty in Renaissance England, kindly sponsored by Dr. Valerie Shooty. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled to welcome Peter Anderson to the podcast to talk about Will Summer, Henry VIII's court fool. Peter K. Anderson is a senior lecturer in history at Orbero University in Sweden. He's the author of Street life in late Victorian London, and Silent History, Body Language and Nonverbal Identity, 1860 to 1914. His latest book, Fool, In Search of Henry VIII's Closest Man, will be released on the 19th of September 2023, but you can pre-order your copy now. Let's dive straight into our conversation. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Peter. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Yes, I've been looking forward to our conversation. So it would be wonderful if we could just start with an introduction, maybe just tell us a little bit about you and your background. Well, uh, I am a senior lecturer in history uh, at Örebro University in Sweden. So I'm born and raised in Sweden. I live and work in Sweden, uh, but I've spent most of my career as a historian researching British history, focusing mainly on the Victorian period, actually. I've written a series of books and articles on uh, Victorian street life, uh, popular culture, and so on. Uh, But in the recent years, I've changed my focus to the early modern period studying fools and clowns of that of that era. The, the common denominator of all my historical research, however, is a continuous interest in outsiders, commoners, marginal individuals, so to speak. Uh, and um, the person that I've been uh, writing about now, Will Summer, is uh, as good an example as any of the type of individual that I think it is important to, to shed light on and, and draw attention to in the past. Yes, I completely agree with you. And we are here to talk about the work you've been doing on Will Summer and your new book, of course, as well. So maybe tell us a little bit about when you first became interested in his life and also what makes him such a a fascinating subject. Right. Well, uh, I've had, even though my my sort of main focus in in my research earlier was was the 19th century, I've had a longstanding obsession with the figure of of the fool, especially the court fool in the the Renaissance. And a few years ago, I wrote a book in Swedish called The History of the Comedian, which sort of traced the figure of the comic entertainer through history from from fools, court fools to, to clowns and music hall and silent films and so on. But the Renaissance fool was a character that stayed with me after that. And I, I, I can't seem to get it out of my head because uh, it's, it's, it's quite a unique uh, phenomenon, quite set apart from other entertainers of the same age. And whenever you find traces of these fools in portraits or in court records, they're quite uh, distinct individuals. They have their own characteristics. They're very interesting to explore. 
And as my book uh, partly seeks to demonstrate, the Renaissance fool cannot be simply described as a precursor to the modern comedian. There is something else to it. And that's uh, something that I find fascinating. And Will Summer, during my researches, has emerged as one of the most interesting examples of the Renaissance fool. He is, he is very elusive. He's quite difficult to pin down. But at the same time, he became quite a legendary figure in the history of history of both comedy and of uh, the Tudor court. Absolutely. And do we know anything about his, his family or his early life? Well, he's, he's quite a frustrating character in that way, because we know very little about him as a person, and we know very little about him outside of, of the court uh, world. There are some mentions about him, but most records about his early life come from later in, in, in history. So they're, they're quite separate from his own lifetime. There was a book written a few decades after his death by a clown called Robert Armin, which traced the, the biographies of, of legendary fools. And in that book, uh, he says quite quickly that Will Summer came from Shropshire, but he doesn't say anything more about that. And I haven't found any other records to, to claim that he was from Shropshire. Uh, another more extensive story is that he was originally employed by a man called Richard Fermer, who was um, a wealthy wool merchant living at a manor in Northamptonshire. But this Fermer was eventually convicted of treason by Henry VIII. And in that period, Will Summer was then moved to the royal court. Also, part of this story is that this uh, Richard Fermer was eventually pardoned on the king's deathbed through um, an appeal made by, by Will Summer himself, so that he, in a way, was loyal to his original master throughout his life. This is a story that is told quite late uh, after Will Summer's death, so we can't be sure that this is true, but, but it, it is a, an intriguing story. Uh, and it's basically the only, the only record we have of his, um, of his early life. He first crops up in, in court records around 1535, the early 1530s. Before that, there is no record of him at court. Um, we know that we know how, how other fools came to court. There seems to have been some sort of informal talent scouting going on, different courtiers, uh, lords and ladies, keeping their eyes open if they spotted a, a man or a woman who seemed to be um, suitable for the role of, of court fool. And then they would write back to, to the court and say, we've found this or this person and uh, he might be what you're looking for. So, so we have some letters along those lines. So, so maybe uh, Will Summer was also recruited in, in that way. Because he does replace another court fool, doesn't he, in around 1535? Is that right? Uh, yes, uh, it seems like, like he does. Uh, there is a, an earlier court fool called Sexton or Patch, who was originally Cardinal Wolsey's fool. And around the time that Will Summer comes to court, Patch seems to be quite old and uh, he, he disappears from the record a few years after that. So, so, so possibly Summer was, was the replacement of, of Patch around that time. Okay, so we know he eventually comes into the into the Tudor court and is there as court fool. So can you tell us a little bit about the role that he actually plays there and why he ends up being such a valued part of the Tudor court and so valued by Henry VIII and his successors? Well, that's um, that's a, where it becomes really interesting because Will Summer especially has a very ambiguous role as a as a fool. The the records about him are quite difficult to sort of get together. On the one hand, there are records that he was that he was beaten, that he was regularly chastised. One of the earliest mentions of him in any source is in uh, the playwright John Haywood's dialogue Witty and Witless from the early 1530s. This text makes very explicit reference to, to uh, Will Summer in, in the context of, of fools generally. And um, when fools are described in, in Witty and Witless, it is mainly the harsh treatment he is subjected to that becomes uh, in focus here. Um, Haywood writes, some beat him, some bob him, some jol him, some job him, some tug him by the arse, some lug him by the ears, some spit at him, some spurn him, some toss him, some turn him, uh, and the, the list goes on. And it ends, not even Master Summer, the king's gracious fool, can avoid this kind of treatment. So, so apparently, Will Summer was just as roughly treated as, as any other fool in this time. But on the other hand... There are also stories of him being very cherished as a, as a court fool, and there's a lot of sympathy and compassion expressed. So probably his role was quite ambiguous, and that is probably the same as, as with most other court fools of this period. But, but his role at court was 
probably not in the in the way that we might uh, think today as a sort of comedian or a, an entertainer in the conventional sense. There were later stories that emerged after his death that he was a witty comedian, that he that he had rhyming games with the king and so on. But the contemporary sources tell uh, a different story because there are no preserved actual jokes attributed to him or there are no stories of him perpetrating practical jokes on other courtiers, which you can find about other fools uh, in this period. So, so he was not probably the type of shrewd, uh, witty comedian that later mythology cast him in as. The thing about Renaissance fools is that they were either natural fools or artificial fools. The artificial fools were skilled comedians who uh, they, they they joked and they made practical jokes and they were they were comics and entertainers and then they were the natural fools and they were employed based solely on their disability uh, intellectual or, or physical and um, I think in the Renaissance and early in the early modern period the natural fools were more common than the artificial fools and that was the sort of main basis for becoming employed as a court fool I think. Yes, because I, I think I've seen mentions of them having keepers as well, or people taking care of them at court. Exactly, which, yeah. Yeah, which would probably point to that. So do we know anything of Summer's appearance or his personality? Uh, we know uh, how he looked because uh, there are quite a lot of portraits of him. Uh, there are no single portraits of him, but but he appears in a, several portraits in the background, especially family portraits portraying the family of Henry VIII and so on. In those portraits, he's standing in the background, looking quite gloomy, quite brooding, uh, not the archetypal fool with a with a bell and cap and so on. So, so it's it's quite surprising to learn that this is uh, the king's fool that we have standing there in the background in dark clothes and a serious demeanor. And that's quite interesting because uh, you want to sort of square that image with the role of court fool that he had. And then we have the, his personality, and we can we can get a, a glimpse of that through some of his uh, sayings and utterances, which were quite often quoted by courtiers who met him, either in, in letters or even in published books. You can find uh, references to uh, Will Summer, who said this or that. And the, the quotes that, that are attributed to him are things that could best be described as gaffes, things that he said, which sort of took on a, a sort of foolish nature afterwards. We have one one writer who said that at one point, Will Summer applauded a bishop because he had a, a good bass voice. And then he adds that he made a bass sermon. So the, the sort of the meaning of the word bass here becomes unintentional, so to speak. And that's the sort of thing that, that he's mostly credited with, putting his foot in it, really. There's another quote that Will Summer once said, if we build a bridge between Dover and Calais, we could go to France on foot. I mean, it's not... It's not a joke. It's just something that that you might say without thinking, really. And according to some writers, uh, this was the sort of basis of, of Will Summer's funniness, really, to his contemporaries. There was one writer who wrote that he, he had a tongue that ran before and his, his wits came halting after. In that way, maybe he was a, a natural fool, or maybe he just was a man who who had this sort of penchant for speaking in a way that that others other people found funny and and in many ways his his jokes were made into jokes by people in his surroundings and they were sort of imbued with meaning by others it, they, they don't seem to have been meant as jokes by himself so that that's pro probably the sort of best uh, insight we can get of, of his uh, personality and you've mentioned a number of terms as you've been talking. So you've you've already explained the natural versus the artificial court fool. But then, of course, there's the clown that you were talking about before. There's the court gesture. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about how those last sort of few roles differed? Yes, the word clown emerges later in the in the 16th century, and then it, it's applied to a type of character in in, in the theatre in in stage plays. In, in the Elizabethan and the Shakespearean uh, theatre world, uh, the clown emerges as one in the sort of theatrical company who, who always uh, plays the clown role. And so they become a sort of professional comedian. They become the person in the dramatic company who, who is uh, doing the funny business, basically. And that's a different 
profession. That's a, that's a different thing from the court fool and the natural fool, of course. But the Elizabethan clowns, they could work both as stage actors and court fools. We have the most famous Elizabethan clown, who was Richard Tarleton, and he um, performed at the court of Queen Elizabeth uh, while also working, and uh, mainly working perhaps in the theatre. So, uh, but, so he, he is some sort of a threshold character here, where the, the court fool is gradually sort of changing into the Elizabethan clown and the stage clown, and a character that is more a precursor of the modern comedian, you might say. And then we have the word jester, which is not as common earlier in the, in the 15th, 16th century. It becomes more common in the 17th century when you start talking about court jesters. And it seems that court jesters are something else than the earlier fools. There is a, a degree of professionalization, you might say. And, and uh, these later court jesters seem to be more of the type of artificial fools who were good at uh, entertaining, good at making jokes, sometimes even uh, with a sort of critical voice directed at people and so on. They could make fun of courtiers and sometimes get into trouble. Archie Armstrong, who was, um, who was uh, the Jacobean court jester in the early 17th century, he was sometimes punished for sort of speaking out of term and and uh, being a bit too forthright in his in his jokes, but he seems to have been a different type of fool than than Will Summer and the and the natural fools of the earlier Renaissance. You've talked a, a bit about some sources and how people describe Summer a bit later, but so how was he viewed by his contemporaries, and what insights do you think that offers us into early modern views of people with disabilities? Um, well, that's interesting because the, we, we can really only glimpse uh, Will Summer when he is viewed by others. We, we have no writings by himself or anything like that. Probably he was, he was illiterate. But he is often referred to, interestingly, with, with sympathy and compassion. One of the chief figures of, of the court at this point, a diplomat called Nicholas Wooten, writes in a letter referring to my fellow Will Summer, God keep him warm wheresoever he may be, which is a very clear expression of, of some sort of compassion for this man. Other, other scholars have, have made a parallel between the court fools and pets, interestingly, and they raised the question, were court, court fools, in a way, human pets? And uh, I wouldn't go that far, perhaps, but, but it, there is a, a, a sense in which these um, men and women were sort of present at the court, and they sort of, they languished in the background, a bit like a cat or something, and, and uh, sometimes you would go up to them and talk to them, or, or just make sure they were comfortable and so on. The, that's why sort of the Renaissance fool is so interesting, because it's something different from a, from a clown or a, or a jester. They, they have this very ambiguous, very, very strange role, really. There are, there are many indications that, that Will Summer had a tendency to fall asleep in odd places and falling asleep on a gate or falling asleep wherever. And then the courtiers would come to him or servants would come to him and put a pillow under his, under his head or something like that. And there's, there's even a, a very interesting indication that he slept with the dogs in the corner of the, of the room when he was in attendance uh, with the king. And that's also very, very strange to us, of course. And um, this is quite revealing, perhaps, of how servants were treated and, and, and viewed in, in, in that period. But at the same time, I mean, there's also, alongside this compassion and this sympathy, there's also quite a bit of cruelty. He was a bully victim, really. Uh, he was a butt of jokes someone you could mess around with and make fun of and so on. There's one story about him being pushed off a horse by other courtiers just for the fun of it. So it was quite ambiguous uh, and it's not a, something that we can really glamorize or uh, idealize. It is quite, quite cruel here. And that sort of reflects, I think, the, the early modern views of disability, which were quite ambiguous. Disabled people were, in a sense, seen as both sinners and as the epitome of, of innocence and receivers of, of charity. That's um, an interesting reflection, I think. And so what actually happens to him after Henry dies in, in January 1547? Uh, he goes on to be a, a court fool after, after Henry. So he's court fool for Edward and uh, Mary Tudor. 
and he is even registered as a, an attendant at the coronation of, of Queen Elizabeth. But then he dies shortly after that. So, so he is uh, basically present throughout the, the Tudor period. Possibly his role later in life was more sort of peaceful, if you like. The, the references to him being beaten and harshly treated come from earlier in his in his life maybe he uh, learned the hard way to to sort of know how to how to behave and how to stay out of trouble and maybe he was also in a way kept at the court out of nostalgia as a as a sort of person who reminded people of the old days of king henry so so possibly uh, his his role at court was different by then and do we know where he's actually buried? Uh, there is a, a burial record of him from from Shoreditch, actually, in, in, in London. And there is a modern plaque at uh, the church in, in Shoreditch commemorating him. But this this doesn't have anything. I mean, this is quite new. So we don't know um, exactly where, where he's buried, but, but it, it, there, is, there is a burial record of him there. So, so apparently he was, he was living in town in London. And this is also interesting, perhaps, because we, we might have this idea of court fools residing at court and having uh, their own quarters um, at, the, at the royal palaces and so on. But I don't think he did. I, I think he was called in at special occasions uh, and so on. There is even a very interesting in, in the court accounts uh, of him being washed and of his feet being washed for probably for the coronation of, of Queen Mary. So this indicates that, I don't know, maybe maybe some servant or court attendant went out into London to try and find him again and, and brought him to, to court and, and made him look nice for the, for the coronation. That's the sort of image I get, but, uh, but we don't really know. Yeah, that is fascinating. I, I was under the impression they resided at court, so that's really interesting. So, so you talked a little bit about this sort of mythology that develops around him. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, that's the, that's the interesting thing when, when he dies, because quite shortly after his death, he is brought up as a, as a sort of name in the roster of great English comics uh, that have gone before the, the Elizabethan clowns. So he's quite mentioned often in, in Elizabethan literature as a precursor of clowning and uh, foolery generally. And many writers sort of invoke his spirit when they, when they write comic pieces. And, and, and of course, a lot of an anecdotes are attributed to him and a lot of jokes are attributed to him posthumously. But the thing is that these jokes can also be found attributed to another fool or another clown. So uh, this is where the, the mythology comes going. So in a way, he, he's, he becomes a sort of Robin Hood or whatever, a sort of semi-fictionalized character. This fictionalized version especially becomes uh, taken up by uh, Elizabethan drama. And in, in the late 1590s, there's quite a vogue for writing plays about the age of Henry VIII. Samuel Rowley's play, When You See Me, You Know Me, has a quite a big uh, role for Will Summer. And then he, he is quite a shrewd and, and witty comedian in that play. Thomas Nash also in includes a fictionalized version of him in his only preserved play, Summer's Last Will and Testament. Interestingly, Shakespeare does not include him when in, in his play about Henry VIII. He leaves him out. But the fun thing about that is that his absence has to be explained. There is a a vague reference in, in the prologue of that play that you will not be seeing this funny character that you might expect to see in a play about Henry VIII. And that only goes to show how, how popular he was as a, as a fictional character in this period and how the audience sort of expected to see him in, in plays about, about Henry VIII. But, but very little of, of the real man remains in, in this myth, of course, that circulated. It's mainly interesting how quickly this myth started to circulate, only a few a few decades after his death, really. Yes, and I'm sure people would, would love to know more about your work and find out what you're doing and what you're up to. So is there anywhere online that they can go to, to follow what you're doing? I'm not very present online, <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, that that has its pluses. Yeah. Well, I, I am now, now that we're, we're talking, of course, and I, I'll see if, if we can change that. But uh, but you can find a, a small uh, article that I wrote about this in Many Headed Monster blog, which is a very good historical blog that you can find online. And a lot of historians write there about different sort of micro historical projects that they're, that they're doing. And you can find me me there in a, in a short piece if you want to get a, a sort of teaser for the book. 
Wonderful. Well, I'll make sure to look that up and add the link to our show notes. And before I can let you go, Peter, there's one more thing that I ask all my guests for, and that's for a Tudor takeaway. So something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. Yeah, I gave that a, a bit of thought. Uh, and, you know, since since I've mainly worked in, in different historical periods and so on, I, I could give you loads of loads of things about the Victorian period, of course. But I've spent a few years studying uh, the Tudor period as well, of course. The, the book that I came up with and that really sort of inspired me uh, many years ago is, is Charles Nichols' book, The Lodger, about Shakespeare, which is a, a really fun approach to, I suppose this, this sort of is included in the, in the Tudor period, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> oh yes, um, but it's a great book, and it's it's like a de- detective story where he where he sort of approaches the everyday life of Shakespeare really through a, a small record in in the archives, and that's really fun to to read if you want to get a sort of close view of life in in London in in the 16th century, and especially if you're interested in who Shakespeare was as a as an ordinary man. So that's a very good book, yeah. Absolutely. And you know what? In something like 218 episodes, no one's ever mentioned it. So you've done. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> so thank That's you wonderful. so much. There's, there's another one to add to my very long list of books that I need to read. Mm. But it's been so <laughs> lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk tutors with us. It was great. Thank you for having me. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.